Hello and welcome to the presentation of the Boggs and Fens Honor. I'm very happy to be presenting this uh, today. This was a very interesting honor for me to prepare for. Um, I learned a, an incredible amount uh, while getting ready to do this honor. My name is Gerard Zavosky. I'm an area coordinator for the uh, Southern New England Conference and I'll be presenting this honor today. Um, in order to uh, receive this honor, you must watch this presentation in its entirety. You must uh, submit a completed answer key to your club director. You must complete two of the following, and these also have to be submitted to your director with your completed answer key. You must visit an exhibit or conservatory of wetland plants, mosses specifically, um, and carnivorous plants, and look how they are adapted to living in poor soil, cold temperatures with a lack of nutrients. Um, visit a zoo where there are wetland animals, and if possible, observe some of the ones that we learned about while studying bogs. Uh, you can watch a DVD or a video about bogs, plants, or animals that live in bogs. Draw or paint a picture of something that you had fun learning about while studying about bogs and fens. And talk to your group, write about, or make a short video about a real-life bog conservation project and explain why this specific type of habitat should be saved. Um, now, granted, um, in this time of quarantine and uh, social distancing, it's going to be difficult to do some of these, uh, especially uh, like going to a zoo or something like that. Um, but there's still plenty of opportunities. You can do the DVD. You can uh, do some uh, extra research of, on your own on the Internet um, and find out more uh, about a bogs or fence and um, do a little conservation project. Go for a walk in a nearby bog or fen. Um, I did get word that the Southern New England Conference uh, property at Camp Winnipeg has a fen um, there. So, um, you know, you could take a short hike uh, maybe there or in some other uh, outdoor place that may have a bog or a fen and uh, just do a little study, a little project about that. So this is a bog. Um, it's a picture I got off the internet. Um, we have a lot of cranberry bogs around my house. Um, when you people around here, and this is in, I live in Plymouth, Mass, uh, you think of cranberry sauce. Here's a cran can of cranberry sauce. Um, that's what you think of when you think of bogs around here. But I found out while doing this presentation that cranberries really aren't raised on bogs. Uh, they're raised in fens. And uh, we'll find out more about that as we go through this presentation. Um, but this is a bog, this picture. It looks kind of like a swamp. Um, and we're going to find out what is the difference between a bog and a fen and uh, the diversity of the plants and animals that live in a bog. So what is a bog? Well, a bog is a wetland, obviously, and it's formed in cold climates or in high altitudes, and it gets its water only from the atmosphere. That means from rain or snow. A bog has no other sources of water, such as springs, rivers, or streams flowing into it. And because of this, bogs are low in mineral nutrients. So a lot of wetlands get nutrients uh, washed downstream from rivers or streams or even bubbling up from springs from underground. Um, but there's not a lot of minerals in uh, rainwater or snow. So um, bogs are very, very devoid um, and weak in mineral resources. Also, bogs have a mat of specialized vegetation which grows out over the water. As leaves and plants die, they fall into the water and decompose or break down. Decomposition is very slow, which causes the accumulation of organic matter at the bottom. And this organic uh, matter is called peat. Uh, you may have heard of peat moss. Uh, a lot of people put peat moss in their garden. Um, it's to help add not only carbon, but um, a source of m moisture to the, your, your garden. It's a type of uh, dirt or plant material that really is good at absorbing moisture. And we're going to see why that is a little bit later. Um, but because of the peat and the uh, decaying organic matter, the water in a bog is acidic and is very low in oxygen. And we'll continue with this. 
Um, methane gas is a byproduct of decomposition of the uh, plant that uh, the uh, deposit in the bog, and the methane gas can sometimes be uh, be seen bubbling up, uh, especially if you're walking on a bog and changing the uh, the this displacing the peat a little bit from under your feet. Um, you can see gas rising up from the bog. Uh, species diversity in bogs is usually very low due to the harsh environment, but bogs are important for storing carbon. Now, although species diversity is usually low in bogs, what that means is the, the um, there's not a lot of widespread um, different types of animals and plants in bogs, but some of the plants and animals that do live in bogs are very different in amongst themselves. And again, bogs are very important for storing carbon, um, especially in the northern latitudes of Europe, in northern Scotland, and in the um, some of the areas up in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, peat bogs are actually harvested for uh, dry peat, and that is used uh, to help for cooking, for fires. Uh, the dried peat is used as a fuel in some areas. It can be several feet thick. So where are bogs found? I already mentioned in some of the Scandinavian countries in northern latitudes, but they occur mostly in cold, heavily forested regions in the northern hemisphere north of the 45th parallel of, of latitude. And I'm going to show you where that is. Uh, this region is also called the uh, boreal zone. Uh, you might have heard of the tundra. The tundra is part of the boreal zone. Um, bogs can also be found in high altitudes. Um, I know south of the 45th parallel in the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York, there are a lot of bogs. I've seen bogs in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And there are actually bogs and fens also um, in some of the mountains in North Carolina uh, and in um, eastern Tennessee in those areas. Um, so bogs are generally found in higher latitudes north of the 45th parallel, but they can be found in other places, especially if it's cold or mountainous. So where is the 45th parallel? Well, the 45th parallel, as you can see here, this this line on this, uh, this uh, Mercator projection map here, um, I uh, just pointed out where the 45th parallel is. So, if you live in the United States, the 45th parallel is actually the state line between Montana and Wyoming. It's also the northern um, boundary of New York State and of the state of Vermont. Um, that is the 45th parallel. Um, and then it extends in through Maine. But like I said, um, although there's a lot of bogs up in these areas, uh, there are some bogs south of the, this, the uh, 45th latitude as well. So six things are needed for bog formation. A basin with no drainage. So when we think of a basin, we think of a sink um, or a tub without the drain. Uh, basically that's what it is. So how can you get a basin with no drainage? Well a basin with no drainage can be uh, formed from a, uh, a uh, like a kettle pond where you have um, during the glacial uh, periods where ice is buried in a lot of uh, rock and soil and then that ice melts. Now you have a, a bowl that has been uh, created where the ice was um, and if it's uh, really packed with dirt and clay, you have very poor drainage. Uh, some other places are just areas where you have a lot of clay, where you have a, uh, a hollow area and some rocks uh, or, or boulders. Uh, if there's no drainage in there, that can collect water. So a basin is basically anything that can collect water. Um, and to have a bog, you need something that can collect water, a basin, without any drainage. The second thing you need, which we already discussed, is uh, a source of water being rain and snow only. You can't have a, a stream uh, coming into a bog or spring bubbling up from the bog. You need cool to cold climates. Um, and specifically, uh, the reason for that is if you have warmer climates, you end up getting into more of a rainforest type um, situation where you have uh, very um, completely different plant 
life and animal life and the species diversity can be greater. Uh, with cool to cold climates, you're really um, going to end up with what is needed for a bog formation in that type of wildlife and plant life. You also need more precipitation than evaporation, and what that means is you have saturated conditions, which means that um, the bog will never really, really dry out. Uh, we're going to go over the history of a bog, what can occur over years, but um, generally a bog will just eventually spill over the sides of the basin that contains the bog, and you will never actually have um, the bog level going down uh, in evaporating. You're going to have very slow decomposition resulting in peat formation and that is from years of plant material just forming, falling down to the bottom and because it doesn't really decompose that well more and more plant material just gets laid on top. And finally you have some specific and amazing plant adaptations. Now I already uh, discussed that the diversity is very low, meaning that there's not a lot of different species, but the species that are there are very different. I, I know that kind of maybe sounds a little bit uh, uh, weird, but um, there's not a lot of plant species, but the ones we have are different than what you find in other places. And I think with that we're going to take a short break and we'll be back with the next section. Thank you. Oh, welcome back to the continuation of the Bogs and Fens Honor presentation. Uh, we ended off with uh, six things that are needed for bog form formation. Uh, basin with no drainage. Rain and snow are the only sources of water. You need uh, cool and cold climates. Uh, you need saturated conditions, very slow decomposition, and specific and amazing plant adaptations. We also learned that most bogs are north of the 45th parallel. Um, and that's uh, a higher latitude. Um, so you see them at, like in Scandinavian countries and in Canada. Uh, there's a lot of bogs. So next we're going to go on to the three different types of true bogs. Um, so the first one is a blanket bog or a mire bog. So this type of bog has an extensive peat cover um, and it doesn't just cover the basin filled with water, but the blankets extend past the basin boundaries and cover the ground over large areas, including hilltops, slopes, and plateaus. You need about 200 days of rainfall a year to form these types of bogs. Um, so what happens is you have this basin, um, and as plant material keeps settling and not decomposing, it builds up. And then as more weight gets pushed down, some of that peak gets pushed up along the hillsides. Um, and that adds actually to um, a lot of carbon for growth in the surrounding hillsides. But the, the bog itself is still very acidic um, and very low in nutrients. Um, so the, the bog itself still has its own um, interesting plant life and animal life but some of that carbon does get pushed up over the hills and it forms these blankets that extend up past the basin. Um, and so that's a blanket bog or a mire bog. And here's a picture of one. So you can see here would be the, where the water is. And then uh, you have pea and the sphagnum moss on top, which we're going to talk about sphagnum moss. And then you can see how as that gets pushed down, the water doesn't allow much of it to go back up and so some of that just gets pushed down or pushed up over the uh, the hillsides um, over time. It's a very very slow gradual process. So The next type of bog is a quaking bog. This type of bog has floating mats of vegetation including mosses, shrubs, and trees. The whole mat shakes when stepped on, and larger movements may actually cause some trees to sway. And we're going to learn a little bit about that uh, uh, further on, but this is the first type of bog that uh, I encountered that I knew it was a bog when I was camping in the Adirondack Mountains in New York. And 
was hiking down, went off the trail a little bit just to explore this little depression, which had some interesting trees and uh, some water in it. And uh, so I'm walking across and the, the, the land out to where the water was, and I realized that some of the, the small shrubs and trees around me were actually moving. And it was really, really interesting. And I realized I was sitting on a very thick mat. It was probably four or five feet thick of uh, vegetation, but it was all floating. And, and that was really interesting. I quickly turned around. I was afraid of, uh, of falling through the sphagnum moss and the peat, um, which probably wouldn't have happened unless I got too close to the edge. But still, better to, uh, to stay off of uh, bogs. We're going to have some uh, guidance on that a little bit later. So that's a picture of a quaking bog. So you can see we have water, you have the peat and sphagnum moss, and you can actually step out onto here and you can actually get trees forming on this uh, floating uh, peat and sphagnum moss. Uh, you can get shrubs and small trees. And the third type of bog is a raised bog, and that's a type of bog in which peat deposits grow above the water level, and it actually forms domes or raised mounds. These mounds may be surrounded by water, uh, and they can actually form some islands. Uh, and these are sometimes called Pocosin in the east. Uh, if you look up Pocosin and North Carolina, you'll find that um, in North Carolina, um, vernacular or lingo or their language, uh, what they know uh, as bogs, as we know as bogs, they, a lot of the locals call them Pocosins down in the mountains of North Carolina, um, which I had not heard that term before and I found that to be very interesting. So here's a picture of a raised bog or a drawing, a diagram I should say, and it shows um, where you have this basin is filled with peat, but it's also filled with uh, water, so it's com it's still completely saturated. And that's remember that's one of the definitions, one of the requirements for a bog is that it's saturated. So even though it's filled with peat, it's not dry. It's very very saturated, very very wet. So what's the difference between a bog and a fen? Well, the major difference has to do with the source of water. Bogs are closed systems that have no connection to groundwater sources. Remember, they can only get their uh, water source from snow or rain. Where fens are more of an open system that depend on a groundwater source, like a spring or a small stream. Fens are less acidic. They have more nutrients because they have a source of water coming into them bringing minerals. And they support a greater uh, diversity of plants and animals. Uh, for a fen, the mat of vegetation is composed primarily of grasses and herbs. So, and, you know, some small shrubs. So you really don't see uh, that heavy mat of sphagnum moss. You do get some sphagnum moss um, and some mosses. But primarily you get uh, tufts or tussocks of grass that come up um, in a fen. And so this is what I found out that uh, most of the cranberry bogs um, that are farmed in Plymouth, at Massachusetts, and in Carver, Massachusetts are actually fens. So I did some research and looking on the internet. Um, so a lot of the cranberries, historically, um, the, the native cranberries were um, found in true bogs, in these little what were kettle ponds that actually formed into bogs and um, and over time the cranberries grew in this peaty um, area with no drainage but as people discovered that, that cranberries were very tasty and they wanted to harvest them and grow them commercially um, they realized that it was very important to be able to control the water so growing cranberries is really about um, water management um, and how well you can manage your water. So instead of just growing cranberries in these small bogs, they created their own bogs, um, or their, they call them bogs, but they created their own fens with water channels and pumps and um, piping systems so that uh, they can actually control the water, so they can uh, have the proper characteristics that they need uh, the environment to grow the cranberries properly and then when it comes time to uh, harvest them a lot of cranberry growers harvest the bogs by the cranberries by flooding the bogs up 
and the cranberries naturally float to the top after they get beat off the uh, the vines or the, the shrubs. So, um, cranberry bogs are actually cranberry fens for um, for uh, most of the uh, the growers that uh, that I'm familiar with anyway. So here's a picture of a fen, um, and you can see down in the uh, lower. Uh, right hand corner there's a source of water coming into this. I had to crop the picture a little bit. Um, I've seen quite a few fens in the Adirondack Mountains, uh, numerous fens in the White Mountains uh, while hiking and backpacking. Uh, you see uh, fens quite a bit with little uh, trickles of uh, runoff um, and little springs coming from the side of the mountains forming these. Uh, some of them are small and some of them are quite large. Some of them can be several acres um, and some can be hundreds of acres. Um, most of the ones I've seen have been relatively small, an acre or less. So what is succession and how do bogs and fens illustrate this process? Well, succession is where one community naturally changes over time and is replaced by a different community. Um, so one succeeds the other. So fens and bogs are often found close together and over time most fens do becomes, become bogs. And that's because uh, peat and the organic matter that's being broken down, it will build up and separate the fen from its groundwater supply. So it will block it up or it will change and alter the course of the water uh, such that that water no longer feeds into that uh, fen and now the only source of water is snow or rain. Um, so as that, when that happens, the nutrient uh, levels drop. Uh, again, with a fen, you have more nutrients to begin with, but as it changes into a bog, those nutrients will be um, extracted from the living plant matter. Those plants will now ha not have the nutrients they need um, because they've used them all up. They will die and add into that peat formation in the bog. Um, and this can eventually lead to the formation of conifer forests as the uh, bog takes over. Uh, some of the plants that we're going to learn about will actually form forests on the bog and you'll end up with um, uh, raised bogs uh, that which turn into forests. And I think that's a good time to take a break. So um, we're going to take another short break and we'll come back in just a few minutes. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to the continuation of the Bogs and Fens Honor presentation. Uh, we finished off with succession and how do Bogs and Fens illustrate this process. We found that um, Fens generally gradually change over time into Bogs due to the um, closing off of the groundwater supply. We're going to show some images now on uh, how that uh, succession occurs. Um, so here we have a basin that's filled with water um, and you can see the water level. Now, um, what happens is we start to get some sphagnum moss growing over the water. As that rots, it uh, or it doesn't rot, as it decays actually, it uh, turns into peat. Uh, we start to get uh, the some trees and some other plants and bushes growing in from the edges and moving in. As time continues, you can see that the peat now covers the water. So the water is sitting, um, the peat is sitting on the water floating like a raft. We still have the sphagnum moss on top and that's vital. Uh, we're going to find out about sphagnum moss in a little bit. And you can see that the trees are starting to grow inward towards the center as more and more peat um, builds up and that floating mat uh, gets thicker. It allows for uh, more trees to actually build up and grow on that. And then step four we see we have the basin now is completely filled with peat. Um, it's a very heavy sodden peat um, and it provides uh, a good base for more and more trees and as those trees start to grow in and um, die and break down and they start to decay they add more different nutrients to that and it 
eventually uh, turns into a uh, evergreen forest, a coniferous forest, which lays the ground for um, deciduous or leafy trees. So let's go into some adaptations of bog plants. So bog plants um, are quite different than plants you find in other places. A lot of bog plants have exposed leaves that are covered in a waxy material. Um, they sometimes have thick woolly hair-like fibers um, or they hide their pores in deep pits on the underside of the leaves. And this is to conserve nutrients and to reduce toxins such as too much iron and magnesium that uh, might get in because these plants aren't used to growing with a lot of minerals. So if there's too much iron and magnesium that leaches in from other sources then um, it could be toxic to the plant. So this is an image I took off the internet of Labrador tree leaves. Um, you see Labrador tree tea, uh, quite frequently in the White Mountains, especially in the higher elevations. Um, the leaves are also quite leathery, and that is something else. A lot of bog plants have leathery or almost waxy-like uh, leaves. Um, most bog plants are low to the ground. Um, and they have very slow or stunted growth. Um, you'll see a lot of the trees that grow in bogs and fens um, grow very, very slowly. Um, most of the plants are very, very uh, small and short. So cranberries, it looks like they grow on vines, and actually I, I wrote cranberry vines here. Um, it's actually a small, uh, very small shrub, and but the the branches just lay along the ground and roots form from those branches. So it grows very similar to a vine. Uh, some other adaptations of bog plants, they must be able to survive dramatic temperature differences and they must be able to live in acidic conditions with low nutrients. So let's talk a little bit about sphagnum moss and why that's vital to bogs. So sphagnum moss or peat moss, which I already mentioned peat moss um, at the very beginning, it's a plant that shapes and drives the bog chemistry. Without sphagnum moss, you wouldn't be able to have bogs. So sphagnum moss is different than other moss. It has gas-filled cells that help it to float, and it has amazing absor absorption properties, and it enables it to hold many times its own weight in water. And it grows from the top up, and it dies just a small distance down the stem. So what happens is more new growth comes, and it will die um, all the, the, uh, the little side leaves like material that comes out of the side of the moss will actually uh, die off very quickly so only the top part remains uh, alive. So I have some sphagnum moss here I dug out of this fen, um, the cranberry fen near my house so I don't know if you can can see this. So I'm going to do a little demonstration. Um, so what I have is I have some water and I have the sphagnum moss. Now there's not a whole lot of sphagnum moss here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in. So if, if I were to scrunch this all up, I mean it's just a fistful, but if I put it in this thing of water, and let's see, and it pretty much picked up almost all the water, and you can see I'm squeezing it out. It's like a sponge. Um, so it holds an immense amount of water. Um, and so that is why sphagnum moss is vital to the bogs because it does hold water like that um, and, and it enables the bog environment to become very saturated and stay moist uh, year round. So it grows very slowly out from the shore, as we already discussed. It eventually forms a floating mat of vegetation over the open water. And the mat results in the sun not being able to shine and warm the water below. So that means that water stays cool. And when new mass forms, the old mass, the old moss mass is pushed underwater and it decays very slowly and turns into peat. And as it slowly decays, tannins and acids are released. Um, specifically, one of the acids is tannic acid. It's formed from the tannins, and that kills bacteria, and it removes the dissolved oxygen. Um, so without a lot of bacteria and without a lot of oxygen in that water, the peat um, doesn't really...
decompose anymore. And in fact, there are some peat bogs in uh, the uh, Scandinavian countries and even, I believe, in Scotland where they have found uh, human bodies. They're called uh, uh, bog people or peat people or peat bodies. Um, and they are incredibly, incredibly preserved. Some of them are maybe 2,000 years old or even older, and the bodies are almost perfectly preserved, but they lack bones because of the acidic conditions. Even though the, um, the body itself is relatively intact and preserved, the acidic water actually dissolves the bones, which is kind of weird. Um, but they found some of these. They almost look mummified. Um, but they're not. They're just uh, bodies that have not really decomposed and have just been um, in these uh, in the peat bogs for thousands of years. So the dead peat moss accumulates until it is many feet deep, and it eventually reaches ground level, and it will fill the bog completely, as we saw in the succession images. Sphagnum moss supports a variety of acid-loving plants. Shrubs and trees can grow on the top of the floating mass over deep water. Um, it's also called a bog forest. And when stepped on, the mats shake. And I already discussed that and how, when I was on one, it, how it shook and we get, got little waves going, which was pretty weird. Can tilt and ripple, causing even trees to sway. Now here's some of the guidance. Falling into a bog can be dangerous. Uh, so it's best to stay on designated boardwalks and trails. So if you find yourself someplace um, when you're out hiking um, and you're off of a trail and the ground starts to sway a little bit and it might be a bog, then I highly recommend that you turn around and go back the way you came because you don't want to get pushed through into that sphagnum and peat um, into the bog itself. So one of the interesting plants that we find in bogs are carnivorous plants. Um, so carnivorous plants they do not require a lot of nutrients from the ground because they get uh, some of their mineral, mineral nutrients from animal life, specifically uh, primarily insects. So carnivorous plants trap animal prey, primarily insects, to make up for the loss of nutrients they can't obtain from the environment. The traps are modified leaves and may be active or passive, and we're going to discuss that a little bit depending on how they catch their prey. So the first plant we're going to talk about is a pitcher plant. These plants form a slippery, colorful, cupped leaf and have a nectar-covered lip to lure insects. When an insect slips and falls in, it's trapped by downward pointing sharp hairs. So they have this tube, and inside the tube are all these little hairs. But the plant itself in the middle has some like um, uh, liquid in the bottom that can digest the, uh, the insect. But right on the lip, that covers the, 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 this tube, there's really sweet nectar and it attracts flies and, and other insects. And then when they go down in, they can't climb back up because of these sharp downward pointing hairs. And these enzymes in the liquid at the bottom uh, digest the, uh, the insect. I have a picture here. Here's a picture of a pitcher plant. So he, the nectar would be up inside this hood so the plants would, or the insects would fly in um, and fall down in here or maybe climb down in thinking there's more nectar and then they can't get back out. Pitcher plants um, very common um, in the uh, White Mountains and in the Adirondack Mountains um, in New York State. Um, I know they're also very common in uh, like up in Minnesota up in some of the bog and wet areas up there. You can find pitcher plants almost anywhere where you find uh, a lot of uh, standing water in cold weather conditions. Uh, sundew is another one, and that's an active one. So a pitcher plant is passive, meaning it doesn't do anything. It just it grows. The plant or the insect comes in, it falls, it gets digested. A sundew is an active one. So it has sticky hairs um, on this little flat piece of uh, plant material with all these little hairs you can see on the picture. And there's little drops of sticky dew on the end and when an insect comes in and lands on that sticky dew it just gently folds over and it traps that insect in there and then the insect is digested. Um, you may have heard of Venus flytraps. They're another active uh, carnivorous plant. 
they grow mostly in bogs in the southern latitudes, the bogs you see in uh, North Carolina. You don't see Venus flytraps in the cold weather bogs north of the 45th parallel. Uh, the Venus flytraps are more warm weather bogs. And bladderwort, and now uh, these are some of my favorite uh, plants, uh, carnivorous plants. That's another active plant. Um, and they grow with no roots. They actually float on the surface of the water. They obtain their nutrition uh, from the water or prey that they capture in small bladders. Um, they have little teeny trigger hairs on these bladders that when they touch, they open a trap door and the bladder itself has less pressure than the surrounding atmosphere or the surrounding water. So when that hair is trigger and the bladder opens, it actually sucks the insect in. So an insect or a little a uh, single cell organism um, or a little uh, a nymph of an insect that lives in the water would touch this trigger hair and it would will open up and the insect will be sucked in and then digested. Uh, very, very interesting. And the bladder warts only eat very, very small insects, very minute, like mosquito larva size, tiny, tiny, because the bladders are very, very small. So here's um, a picture of bladder warts and I put these yellow arrows that the bladders are on these floating leaves these are actually the leaves of the bladder wart the bladders are on the sides or on the underside of the leaves and they're very very tiny uh, they may get a quarter inch in diameter but most of them are smaller than a quarter inch so they can only um, suck in and digest very very small animal life some other plants or trees that are found in bogs, we're going to continue with this uh, after a short break. Thank you. Welcome back, and this is part four of the Bogs and Fens Honor presentation. Uh, we finished off with talking about uh, sphagnum moss, a very important um, part of a bog. You can't have a bog without sphagnum moss, and how it absorbs so much times more its wa uh, water uh, than other types of uh, organic material. And we talked about some carnivorous plants, the pitcher plants, the sundews, and the bladder warts. And we're going to talk about some other uh, plants that are found in uh, bogs. Um, the first one I want to talk about is the tamarack. Uh, it's a tree. It's a very cold tol tolerant conifer tree. It grows in very cold at places. Um, unlike most conifers that um, are, we term as evergreen trees, um, the tamarack tree actually loses its needles in the fall and it grows new ones every spring. Uh, if you ever have a chance to see a tamarack tree, touch the needles. They're much softer than uh, the needles of most evergreen trees. And in the fall, the uh, leaves turn a beautiful, you can see in the picture here, beautiful, beautiful golden yellow color uh, before the leaves fall off. Uh, they need open sunlight and they can survive in a wide range of soils, including the low nutrient soil and acidic soil that you find in bogs. Uh, that's on the floating peat. Uh, the next tree or uh, plant is a cranberry. So I actually uh, in the cranberry fens near my house I dug up some uh, a couple of cranberry plants. So um, we're all probably familiar with the berries. This is what the cranberry vine looks like or the, the shrub. Uh, you can see it's actually very small. The leaves are tiny. They're very leathery, uh, very stiff um, and it just spreads a very uh, short mat, um, the bush as, it, as the branches fall over they uh, get roots on the, uh, the edges and it grows very very much like a vine and it forms a mat um, maybe six inches high is that probably about the highest um, and gets covered as you can see by the picture with cranberries. Um, many species of insects eat live off of and reproduce in the cranberry bushes. Um, they need a very acidic environment to grow. And you see now that it says cranberries are grown commercially in man-made bogs. Most of them aren't truly bogs, but they are fens um, because they do get sources of water 
um, from either man-made pump houses or redirecting of streams to allow people to uh, manage that water supply. A leather leaf, that's another plant uh, which I actually uh, took a sample of the other day. So leather leaf is a flowering shrub that keeps its old leaves until the new leaves are well grown. Uh, the breathing pores in these, and I can't show you because I don't have a microscope attached to the computer, but the breathing pores on the other side of the leaves are very, very deep. Um, it says the leaves feel leathery, and they definitely do feel leathery, um, and they're a little bit brown underneath it. These look uh, kind of a light colored, but if you look at uh, a little bit of an angle, they're kind of more of an amber or a beige color. Um, and there's tiny little flowers on these. These flower uh, very early in the spring, and right now the cranberry um, fen uh, near my house is just loaded with uh, uh, these little bell-shaped white flowers. It's really pretty. Pink lady slippers. Uh, these need very acidic soils, and they also need a special fungus uh, to help it absorb nutrients. Uh, this species of plant is common in northern United States and Canada, but is uh, considered endangered or vulnerable in many areas. So um, most areas where pink lady slipper grows, you're not supposed to dig it up. Uh, you're not supposed to pick it. Uh, you're not supposed to move it. Um, a lot of people think, oh, I'll dig some up and transplant it and um, put it in my garden. But it needs very, very specific uh, environment for it to grow, and it also needs that fungus. So even though you may have a boggy area or a damp area in your yard, uh, in your uh, like a flower garden, um, and it's shaded maybe, because they do like to grow in shaded areas, it may not grow because the fungus that it needs is not in that soil. So um, in most areas, uh, you can't uh, pick or transplant lady slippers, uh, but they are beautiful to look at and to take pictures of. A bog fern, uh, that's another type of plant that grows in the bogs. Uh, there's a lot of different ferns that grow in or near bogs. Um, the bog fern is uh, one of the larger ones. It's very, very bright color, and the fronds, or the, the individual leaf sections of them, grow about two feet long, or 24 inches. They shoot from a rhizome, which is like a, it's like a root. It's really a stem that grows underground and then shoots off more um, leaflets from it. The leaves die off uh, in, during winter time, and it pref uh, prefers, uh, it is most often found in the very moist and acidic soil, soft and spongy. And that sounds exactly like what you'd find in a bog or in a fen. There's other types of ferns as well um, that grow in, uh, in bogs and fens too. And the black spruce. Uh, so the black spruce is very common. Uh, I see that quite a bit up in the northern part of the White Mountains and up in the Adirondacks. Um, it's, it's much more common even as you get further north up into Canada. So the black spruce has a very shallow root system that instead of growing deep, it mostly grows horizontal and very shallow. And as the tree grows into the bog, you can imagine as it starts to gain weight, the tree actually starts to sink. And as these branches now are under uh, the sphagnum moss and in the peat, those branches will actually send up new shoots from them. So you'll have the, the parent tree with all these little um, smaller trees growing up around it, which are actually growing up from the horizontal limbs that are uh, buried. Um, and eventually the parent tree will die, and they usually die from a drowning, um, because eventually that main root mass sinks so far both into the peat, and if the peat hasn't filled the entire uh, basin, um, and there's a lot of standing water, the tree can't take up all the water that's available for it, and it will end up dying. Uh, in Labrador tea, we've already discussed Labrador tea. Uh, you can see that uh, in the White Mountains in uh, New England. Uh, you probably see it uh, up in uh, Maine and Vermont um, and in New York as well. Uh, it's very bog specific. You see it in the mountains, but you don't see it growing in very rich soil areas. Where you see it is in rocky outcroppings where there may be a little, I like to think of them as a micro bog, a little. Um, a tiny basin, maybe, um, you know, no more than four or five feet by four or five feet. Um, 
that over time develops, has moss in it, and it develops a little bit of very acidic, very poorly nutrient uh, soil, and the Labrador tree will grow from that. So you see it along hiking trails as you're climbing up mountains. Um, the dense hairy twigs and sticky white flowers attract huge number of insects, and that's so true. Um, in July and August, uh, late from late June through early August, when the Labrador tea is uh, blooming, um, you can smell it. Uh, it attracts a lot of different types of flying insect, bees and wasps, and different types of flies as well. Now we're going to discuss, uh, spend a little bit of time talking about some animals that can be found in bogs and fens. Um, and actually, um, you know what, I think I'm going to go back to the plants just for one second here. Um, when you're doing your write-ups for this honor to present to your director to earn the honor, um, I just presented some of the plants um, that are available and that you can find in a bog or a fen, but um, there are more. Um, but like we mentioned earlier, the diversity is very, very uh, small. Um, but the plants do have very specialized structures. So um, I encourage you to actually spend a little time and try to find out about some other interesting plants uh, that grow in bogs and fens. Um, I think you'll be surprised uh, at some of the, uh, the different uh, species that grow there and some of what they, they offer to view and to look at. Uh, it's really, really interesting. And I think with that, we're going to take another break. So uh, we'll be back with you shortly. Oh, welcome back. And this will be our fifth and final section of the Bogs and Fence presentation. Uh, so we finished off uh, talking about uh, some of the different types of plants that we find in bogs, the different types of trees, the tamarack and spruce, uh, the Labrador tea, uh, the leather leaf, some of the different uh, uh, special things that the plants have, like leathery leaves, sometimes they have deep pores uh, and hairy undersides, and all of them are able to survive in the very acidic, um, damp environment of the bog. So now we're going to look at different animals that live in the bogs um, and fens. So um, the uh, first among these that I want to discuss are the sandhill uh, crane. Sandhill cranes are a very large bird. Uh, they have a seven foot wingspan and they breed in uh, peaty wetlands um, that you would find in bogs and fens and they migrate annually. So sandhill cranes will migrate to the southern U.S. down into Texas and Florida, even into um, Mexico, northern Mexico. But they breed in the very northern U.S., um, way, way up north, and um, primarily in southern and central Canada. Um, so that's where they do, they spend most of their time breeding, but they do spend a uh, colder climate, colder, colder seasons. Uh, down south, and they're very dependent on uh, on the bogs for breeding. Uh, next is a wood frog. Uh, the, it's the only frog that's found north of the Arctic Circle, and it's primarily terrestrial. That means it spends most of its time on land. It doesn't spend a lot of time in the water. Um, it prefers to spend time in damp uh, logs and, and leaf litter uh, and in boggy areas. They have an explosive breeding cycle. So what that means is that all the frogs head to the water and breed in one or two days. Uh, that's, it's really unreal. Uh, if you live in New England and you go out in the spring, um, it was probably maybe a week or a week and a half ago is where I heard a huge choruses of wood frogs coming out. They're different than the spring peepers. The spring peepers are more of a chirpy sound. The wood frogs have um, uh, more, it almost sounds like a crow. Uh, cawing out in the woods, um, but it, sometimes the sound can be so loud it's deafening. Uh, they hibernate in the winter in dead logs under leaf matter or in burrows. And what's really interesting about a wood frog, here's a picture of one, um, and I've seen them usually around two or three inches long, um, a orangish brown color. Um, they're they're freeze tolerant. That means their heart and their breathing stops completely and much of their body freezes. Um, so 
God has given them very good antifreeze uh, to prevent them from dying in the winter because they do, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, they, they pretty much die, really, in the winter. They freeze. Uh, and then with warm weather, their breathing and their heart functions resume, and the frog wakes up from hibernation and starts that breeding cycle once the water is out because they do lay their eggs in water. Um, that is really the only part of them that's very aquatic is uh, when they breed and lay their eggs. Another uh, animal is a bird, a black-backed woodpecker. Uh, this bird lives year-round in bog areas. Its primary food are the wood-boring grubs of dead conifers, uh, particularly the black spruce. So we talked about the black spruce. It's a very common tree that you find in bogs and fens, especially in the northern latitudes. And um, there's a beetle, which we're going to talk about a little bit, that uh, can infest the black spruce. And the woodpeckers primarily feed on those uh, beetle larvae. And the moose. Uh, the moose, I think we've all probably know what a moose is. It's a large mammal. Uh, it's the largest deer. Uh, it has very long legs and wide feet that makes it very good at wandering in swamps, bogs, and fens. And it can wade and browse in very, very deep water, mud, and muck. And uh, it eats, it's a plant eater. It often stands in deep water to stay cool and also to avoid black flies and mosquitoes. And I've spent a lot of time hiking and I've never seen a moose. Um, uh, but uh, I know there's one in my future. But I do actually have a moose to show you here um, besides the picture. So here's a moose. I just, I had plants. I wanted to show a moose. So um, anyway, um, but moose really, really like bogs and fens um, for cooling off and uh, in those areas for raising young. And here's the spruce beetle. I talked about the spruce beetle. It's only about a quarter inch long, so uh, about that long. Um, and they're black with uh, brown markings on their back. The larvae feed under the bark of all native spruce trees, especially fond of the black spruces and the red spruces. Uh, they normally feed on uh, fallen or dying trees or old or weakened standing trees. So they normally um, don't bother or they're normally not a pest to live healthy trees. They like trees that already have something wrong with them or that are weakened. Um, but that said, sometimes the beetle can be a pest and can ca cause very destructive deforestation. There have been um, a couple instances over the last hundred years where um, hundreds of acres of spruce trees have been wiped out because of the spruce beetle. But it is a native beetle. Uh, the bog copper butterfly. This is a very small butterfly. Its wingspan is maybe an inch and a quarter. Um, so about, mm, I don't know, can you see that? Maybe that wide uh, from wingtip to wingtip. Very, very pretty, dainty butterfly. Uh, they like to sip the drops of dew that cling to leaves uh, and almost exclusively on the nectar of cranberries. And because of this, the bog coppers will probably spend their entire life in the area of one single bog. So they, the caterpillars, the uh, bog copper butterfly caterpillars, uh, grow in bogs and feed on uh, plant matter in the bogs. And then the butterfly itself feeds on the cranberry nectar, um, breeds and lay eggs in the bogs. A hermit thrush. Now this is a, another bird that uh, lives in the bogs, very common in the, uh, the woods in New England um, and very common in bogs. They nest on the ground beneath small trees and shrubs, uh, which when a bog starts to grow and fill in with some of the trees and shrubs along the um, perimeter of it, uh, you will find hermit thrushes in there. They eat mainly insects in the warm weather and in or, yeah, warm weather, and in the winter they eat uh, predominantly fruit, um, dry berries that are still hanging on from the fall. And if you're ever in the woods and you hear beautiful flute-like uh, notes, um, it's probably a hermit thrush or a wood thrush. Um, but hermit thrushes are more apt to be seen in um, bogs and fens. 
Uh, and bog lemmings. Uh, these are small rodents. They're not true lemmings. They're more like a vole. Um, so they have a very short tail. Uh, they can get pretty large. They can get uh, the body itself uh, maybe four to six inches long. Um, and like I said, they have very small eyes, very short tails. They like sphagnum bogs, swamps, and forest meadows. They live in colonies, and they dig burrows and tunnels about six inches below the surface. Uh, what's really interesting, if you go into a, a bog or a fen and you happen to see like a large piece of bark or a log and you roll it over, sometimes you can see where they have made these uh, tunnels in the ground right underneath the log. Something to look for uh, when you're out there. All these interconnected tunnels, like little highways. Um, and it, sa oh, it says right here, and the nests are connected uh, with multiple entrances. And um, there are two species, oh I cut that off, there are two species of those, uh, northern and southern. Um, and the elfin skimmer, this is a little teeny dragonfly and I uh, wish I had a sample I could have showed you. They're very small, it's North America's smallest dragonfly. Um, they're common um, in bogs and fens, but um, they're rare uh, elsewhere. Um, because they're small and they don't fly very well like a lot of dragonflies buzz around. These fly very very slow. They spend most of their time perching on grass um, and they mainly feed on small insects uh, like mosquitoes. It's very small. And when I say small an elfin skimmer the body is only three quarters of an inch long. Um, so they're not very very large at all. And the beaver. I'm sure we've all heard of the beaver. So the beaver is a very large brown rodent got a flat tail, very large web feet. Uh, they chew on trees um, and they do that to, um, to drop them to, to dam water sources um, for food. They drag uh, tree branches underwater where they stay uh, good to eat through the winter. And because beavers can cause water to back up or cut off water supplies altogether, they can actually create uh, fens and bogs. Um, and if you out in the woods a lot, you can see areas where there's some old abandoned beaver dams and a lot of spruce trees and spongy uh, ground that you're walking on. And you can pretty much infer that a beaver had dammed that, maybe a small stream. It built up as it uh, the ground grew up over the peat. The stream actually rerouted around it, and then that area became a bog. And the final thing I want to talk about is a spiritual lesson learned from bogs and fens. Um, so I mentioned I live in Plymouth, Mass. Um, this is a picture here of some cranberry bogs not too far from my house. This was back taken in 2005, or about 15 years ago. Um, it was about 40 acres of cranberry bogs, and the individuals that farmed these cranberry bogs, um, it was a very, it was difficult, hard work just because of how the bog was situated and how the clay was and the water sources. So they decided to sell them and they sold them to the, uh, the government. Um, and the government wanted to restore them to how they were. Um, so years before it was cranberry bogs, it was a beautiful wooded wetland. So they had a lot of uh, native uh, Atlantic white cedars, um, uh, a lot of different species of plants and animals, but it was deemed that it was a very good place to grow uh, cranberries. So all the native species were uh, wiped out, channels were cut in, piping was put in, and cranberries were grown for uh, about 60 years in this area, maybe a little longer actually. So in 2008, the decision was made by the government to restore the bogs to the beautiful natural landscape that it once was. So the cranberry bogs were destroyed. Uh, they were completely wiped out. The area was scraped clean. Um, there were a lot of um, native plants that were brought in. They put up a fence, a 12-foot uh, foot, foot high fence, and that was put up for about five years to keep uh, people and uh animals like deer out of the uh, area to prevent them from uh, munching on or walking on uh, the new plants that were planted. Uh, so the native plants were reintroduced including uh, red cedar or white cedars. I think they planted uh, maybe 5,000 cedars in the 40 acres, maybe even more. It was just a tremendous project. Um, 
And a lot of people didn't think the area was ever going to recover because they planted it, uh, put up the fence, and then they walked away. But then, as you can see in this picture, um, it's almost taken from the same image of that as that first one. Within a few years, the area was renewed, and it was quickly becoming a natural wetland. A host of plants and animals that had not been seen in years uh, began to return. So I used to hike here and uh, when it was a cranberry bog, and you'd see the occasional bird, maybe a red-tailed hawk, um, and not much else, really. Uh, once this occurred, we started seeing uh, muskrat, uh, otters, uh, we see osprey in here now, uh, great blue heron, uh, can uh, Canada geese, uh, and a wide variety of uh, mercansers and other type of ducks uh, nest in here. Um, it's, just, it's a beautiful area, and it's returning to the way it uh, used to be. So the, the bogs and fens in that area were changed uh, from a worldly man-made area to something that is natural as God intended. And the spiritual lesson I get from that um, is what we can do with ourselves as described in Romans 12 2. Uh, do not be conformed to this world, Paul writes, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so I see that how that bog was restored when you push away the man-made things and let God take its course and work within you like God did with that the uh, bogs to restore them to the way that they should be. God will do that within yourself as well. Uh, if you put aside the thing of things of man and let God into your life and let God take control and do the things that is important for you. And that is the end of the Bogs and Fens honor presentation. Um, remember to submit your completed answer key to your club director and complete two of those activities. Thank you very much and have fun. Blessings to all. Bye-bye.